Hey, so it has been a great year in Louisiana, great start to 2020, and I think we're going to be talking about this all year long. It's not just a January thing. How many excited the Tigers won the national championship? So if I'm ever preaching all year long and I just feel like it's not going well and I just start talking about the national championship, you'll know that I feel like I'm struggling and just trying to get a hand clap. Uh, You know, but I thought about how many people, I was one of them, you know, that for years just said, you know, one day we're going to beat Alabama. And then all of a sudden that one day came. Come on, we beat Alabama. Wasn't that awesome? One day we're going to win the national championship. We'll be the ones playing on Monday night, keeping everybody up. All right, one day we're going to have the best quarterback in the land. Thought that would never happen. And so, you know, it's great when you kind of have this moment in your life or this time in your life where you're thinking one day and then you fill in the blank and then that day comes. And so what I'm hoping in this room, you know, is there are a lot of one days that are more important, more meaningful, more significant, have more purpose than the LSU Tigers winning the national championship. I love football, I love LSU, but I hope there is something in your heart, there's a one day in your heart that's gonna make a difference in the world. One day God's gonna use me. One day God is gonna do something in my life that's gonna make a difference in hundreds of people's lives, in thousands of people's lives. One day my testimony is gonna change someone else. And I think we have kind of two different one days in our heart. And maybe you have both or maybe you're one of the others. There's one that's a one day this dream I have is gonna be realized. And, and I hope, look, that dream can be anything, but I hope it's not just for you. I hope that, it, that it's, it's, it's all about God's plan for your life and God's plan for our life is always about reaching someone else. And so maybe it's, you know, one day I'll, I'll have this, this title, I'll reach this level at work, but it's so I can have influence for other people. Maybe it's one day I'll be financially secure so that I can be a giver and so I can bless others. Or or there's just some dream on your heart. Raise your hand right now if you've got a one day dream in your heart. Look, I just wanna see that right off. Look at all those hands. We we wanna see all of those come through. One day, God's gonna bless me with this. God's gonna do this in my life. So we're waiting on that one day. I think there's another kind of one day and it could be just as significant. One day, there's something that you wanna be set free from. All right, it it may be physically. One day, God's gonna heal me of what's going on in my life. One day, God's gonna heal this relationship that's bringing me pain. One day, God's gonna make me financially secure and get me out of the debt and not have all those problems. One day, uh, the hurt that's in my life is gonna be gone. One day, I'm gonna be able to forgive. I won't have this bitterness. One day, I won't have this fear. And, And so I think some of us can have that one day in our life. But whatever it is, That one day is all about God's purpose. So I want to do tonight, I want to look at a story of what that one day looks like. If you have your Bibles, open up to Acts chapter 3. And we're going to read about a man that got his one day. And what I want to see is what does a one day look like? What are the ingredients of one day? What does it take to get to one day? And so Acts chapter 3, it's one of my favorite stories. It is right after, I mean the church has just started. And so you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John is a story of Jesus. Jesus is crucified, he raises from the dead. Acts chapter one, he goes up into heaven, leaves the disciples. Acts chapter two, the church starts. It's the first sermon, 3,000 people get saved, all right? That was a huge next steps class. That's right at 5 p.m., all right? They got them all in next steps, got them all to sign the membership covenant, got them in small groups, all right? Got all that happens in Acts chapter two. And then Acts chapter three picks up right after that. So it's like one of the first days of the church. Things are still crazy, all right? So in Acts chapter three, verse one, it says one day, say one day. One day, Peter and John, these are the leaders of the church, were going to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now, here's what, let's stop right there. Here's what I love about this first verse, is it shows us that our one day usually begins like every other day. Peter and John were going to the temple at three o'clock because that's what religious Jews did every single day. Three o'clock was the time of prayer. There was nothing special about this day. Peter and John, this wasn't like a special day where they, they go to church. You know, we, 
Sometimes we'll miss that because we don't go to church every day, all right? Now, when I was a kid, there were times where I felt like I was going to church every day and twice on Sunday, all right? Literally, you think I'm joking. I can remember the first Super Bowl my mom let me watch. I was in church for so many Super Bowls. I don't know why, I can just tell I'm still bitter. I need to be set free of this tonight. Because this was before DVR. This was before Sports Center. All I had was the paper in the morning. Mama made me go to church and miss the Super Bowl. I don't even know what I was talking about anymore. But anyways, they didn't go to church once a week. So they went three o'clock every single day. So here's the thing. This story, which is amazing, has an amazing beginning. Has a, I mean, has an amazing ending, has a very ordinary beginning. This day was just like every day for Peter and John. So here's the first thing that I want you to know about one day and what it looks like. Um, one day begins one day at a time. One day begins one day at a time. Here's something I think is so important. I love dreams. We kicked off talking about what, what's your one day? What's your dream? I think dreams are so important. But I want you to catch this. Dreams determine our enthusiasm. They get us fired up. They get us motivated. I don't know what you have. You know, people do those vision boards. Or you got little cards written on your, your mirror in there or just what it is to motivate you. Dreams determine our enthusiasm, but our habits determine our future. Dreams determine our, our enthusiasm, but our habits determine our future. One day happens one day at a time. It's what we do every single day that leads to that. And here's one of the things that's, that's important. We never know when that one day is coming. We never know when today is the one day. And so the best thing we can do instead of wait, because so many people have a dream. This is what I, one day God's gonna do this. One day I'm gonna achieve this. One day I'm gonna be set free from this. And we feel like that one day is over here and we're over here and we're waiting for God to bring that one day to us. When God is concerned about today, and God will say, if you'll get healthy habits in your life today, if you will work today on becoming the person that you wanna be, that what happens is today I do what I know I'm supposed to do, and that gets me one step closer. And then today I do what I know I'm supposed to do, and then that just gives me one step closer. And look, I love dreams, and the guys that work with me here on staff, they know. I love talking about goals and strategic plans. Oh, look at this, people laughing at me right now. I love all this kind of stuff, all right? But strong habits are more important than big dreams. And one of the best things that we can do to see and live our one day is treat today like we're supposed to be who we wanna be and have healthy habits today. Now look, that's kind of leadership teaching. You can get that on YouTube somewhere, all right? We're in church. The one day that happened this day was Peter and John laid hands on a man and he was healed. The power of God was in their life. And why was the power of God in their life this day? Because the power of God was in their life every day. I, I don't think, well, you clap your hands for that. I don't think they got up and said, look, this is it. Peter and John, high five, I feel it. This is it, this is gonna be, I know it's gonna happen. We're gonna be on the way to the temple and there's gonna be somebody on the side and they're begging and then they're gonna say something. We're gonna lay hands on they're gonna heal. Spoiler alert, he gets healed, all right? And so and we're gonna lay hands on him, he gets healed. We, we need to go to church today because I think something special is gonna happen at church today. They didn't do that. You know why they went to church that day? Because they went to church every day. Peter and John woke up every single morning and said, I need the presence of God in my life today. One day begins one day at a time. And, and they just fostered this sense that, God, I need you in my life today. I need you in my life today. I need you in my life today. And they created a habit of God's presence in their life. And I thought we've been in this Make Room series, which is awesome. And God is doing amazing thing. We have the Make Room series on Sundays. We have the, the Make Room nights. Peter and John made room for God's presence in their life every single day. If I want God to give me my dream, if I want God to set me free, it begins by me making room every single day for God's presence in my life. It begins with good habits. All right, let's go to verse two. It says, so as they're, they're going to the temple, three o'clock, it says, now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, 
where he was put every day to beg from those going to the temple court. So what this guy did, and this happened a lot back then, if, if you had any deformity, if you couldn't work, there was no uh, social system, there was no welfare, the only thing you could do was beg. So they would bring beggars on the way people going to church. They figured that was their best chance to get money. They knew people were going there. Hopefully they're religious. And so this man was doing this like he did every single day. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. So I want you to focus on that phrase. He asked them for money. Here's the second thing we talk about our one day. Be careful what you ask for. Be careful what you ask for. Because here's the thing. He asked for money. What did God want to give him? God wanted to give him a healing. And so I think about things like this because I'll think about details and kind of how things work out. And so, you know, I wonder if this guy kind of really stepping out in faith got up that morning and prayed, Lord, you know my needs. God, you know I can't, I can't work and I got this, um, you know, I got this bill that's due and I'm going to put me by the gate beautiful and so I just, you know, I, I, I need you to, I, I know there's not a lot of people coming today, you know, because it's, it's a bad day and it's bad weather and it's raining and it's cold. And so people don't always go to church, you know, when it's cold or, or maybe said, you know, it's, it's a good day and the sun's out and the weather's beautiful and people don't always go to church when the weather's beautiful. Catch what I'm doing there. And so, um, you know, she so said that today not be a day that a lot of people are kind of walking through, but God, I need $20 today. Of course, they didn't have dollars. They had other stuff. Lord, I need $20 today. So I wonder about that. Like if he's praying, Lord, just in faith, I need $20. And then God's up in heaven. And I don't know how God gets the prayer requests. If there's like a ticker tape or he's got an earpiece or, you know, but he, he's up there. And, and so he hears that prayer. And he's like, man, that man down there, he's reaching out in faith and he's praying for $20, but I was going to give him a healing. And so he's asking for 20 and he turns to Jesus. He's like, you just got back up here. What do you think I should do? He's asking for $20. Should I give him his healing? Or, and, and so here's the thing. And I'm not saying you shouldn't pray specifically. If you've got a need in your life, pray for it. But I can guarantee you this, whatever it is you're praying for, God has so much more in mind for you. I love this verse, and I didn't even tell him to put it on the screen because we talk about it all the time. Ephesians 3.20. And I read a different version than Pastor Mike reads, so maybe I should have put it on the screen, all right? But I love Ephesians 3.20. It says, now, to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ask or imagine. And if we want our one day, sometimes what we do, I know this is what I do, is I pray about what I think I need. And I have no idea what God wants to do in my life. And so once again, if you've got a need in your life, pray for it. You got a bill due Friday, pray for it, all right? Pray for God to give you the finances for that bill. You got something in your life, you got a sickness in your life, pray for healing. There is nothing wrong with praying specifically but I think the best prayer we can pray is, God, whatever you want to do in my life, that's what I want. And, you know, sometimes even with our one day that's in our mind, Lord, this is what I want my life to look like. God, this is what, if, if you would just give me this, if you would just give me this promotion, if you would just give me this relationship, if you would just, I got this issue in my life, if you would just give me that. And let me, let me make this clear. I don't think there's anything wrong with praying for those things. But the most important prayer that we can pray for our life is, God, whatever you want to do, whatever it is you, because I know while I'm praying for money, in a sense, that's what he said. I'm just using that one. While I'm praying for money, God wants to give me a healing. God wants to do things in my life that I can't even imagine. And so my one day comes when I submit myself to God. And, and, and I love this because you think when Jesus taught us to pray, when Jesus taught us to pray, what did he say? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What's the first thing he said to pray? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Nothing specific. Lord, whatever you want, that's what I want here. Lord, I want your kingdom. I want you to be the number one influence, the number one authority in my life. You bring it down here, and I want on earth what you see in heaven because I can't see what you see. 
all I see is what's here. All I see is that the bills are due and this person's mad at me and this deal's not working out. That's all I see. I can't see what you see. I want thy kingdom to come, thy will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then after that, what does he say? And give us this day our daily bread. Now that's when we can pray for our stuff. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Lord, this is what I think I need today. But God, whatever is in your heart, whatever is in your mind for me, that's what I want to ask. How sad would it have been if God would have just answered his prayer? If God would just said, Peter, look, oh, you're going to be there tomorrow, this, today. You'll be walking through there. This dude's going to ask you for 20 bucks. Give him 20 bucks. And then go on in. And so we talk about one day in our life. Man, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with praying that anything that comes in your mind that you think you need or that you think you want. But we've got to always be open to the idea that God's will for our life may look completely different than anything we ever thought. And I'll tell you this, and this is from experience. I think it's going to be two things. It's going to be different in two ways. It's going to be more amazing than anything we could have ever imagined. It's probably going to be more difficult than anything we could have ever imagined. That's probably why we didn't pray for that. Because we looked at the cost, and Lord, I don't know that I want that. But God says, but you don't understand what's on the other side. We serve a God that was crucified, but then resurrected. And, and so we got to be careful what we ask for. We have to ask not just for what we think we need, but what God has in our lives. So let's go to the next one. Verse 4. This is where it gets fun. Then Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have. How many said that before? All right, we can all be in agreement with that. Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And I love the phrase that rise up and walk. Here, here's, here's the next thing that I want you to see. We're talk about one day. What you have is what you give. What you have is what you give. And I want to look at it three ways. The first thing is this. You may be here tonight and you think, I don't have anything that the world values. It's not just silver and gold. I, I, I don't know if I'm smart enough. I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if I have enough money. I don't know if I have, you know, th these are the things that's getting promoted. These are the things that, you know, kind of gets everybody. I don't have what it takes to succeed. I don't have what the world says is valuable. That doesn't mean that God can't use you. All right. Peter said, look, silver, what you think you need, what the world thinks you need, what the world thinks is important. I don't have that, but I've got something way better than that. In fact, God begins to use us when we run out of resources. When we run out of energy, when we run out of strength, when we run out of ideas, when we run out of pay, whatever it is, when we run out, God picks up there. And, and so a lot of us identify with that silver and gold, have I none, but it's not just silver and gold. Maybe it's, you know, what I want, I just don't have it inside me to get there. But that doesn't mean that God can't use us. So that's the first thing, just because you don't, Think you have what's, what's, uh, what, what's needed doesn't mean that God can't use you. But the third thing is this. If you don't have it, you can't give it. If you don't have it, you can't give it. And this is where it gets fun. This is where I, I'd love to see it because Peter was kind of a brash guy. All right. And what did Peter say? Silver and gold I don't have, but what I have I give to you. Rise up and walk. All right. If Peter had not had the power of God in him, but there was something inside that he knew it. I think Peter kind of understood. And, and I look, I'm kind of adding to this because I, I, I think of situations of what they looked at. I think God was stirring something up in Peter. He'd been going to the temple every single day. And I think he knew God was about to do something. And I think he practiced it. I think he thought, you know, I'll be, I'll be walking along. And then all of a sudden somebody's going to ask me for money. Because he knew they lined up there every single day. It's not like this. So he saw them. And, I'll be, and then the first person asked me for money, I'm going to be like, bam. And I'm just going to hit them. No, that's, that's, that's too forceful. I'm not going to do this. I'm going I'm to be walking along and I'm going to do something like this. I, I, I think he knew. It, man, he was excited. Because you look at it, he's, he's walking. This, this guy asked for money. And Peter's been waiting for that moment. Because Peter was kind of brave. He's like, look at us, look at us. And he kind of gets his attention. And I think John was embarrassed. Because John's kind of the meeker dude. He was kind of laying on Jesus' shoulder. I don't know if you have anybody like that in your life. That they act up in public. They don't care what anybody thinks. 
So I think John was like, oh gosh, he's going to do this again. So he kind of he walks over here. And Peter says, silver and gold I do not have. But what I have, I give to you. If it's not inside me, I can't give it to anyone else. And that's why going back to the one day, because I never know when that one day is going to come. So here's the thing. It was a one day for this man who was getting healed, but it was also a one day for Peter because he got to experience and be used by God. But he never knew when it was going to happen. And so what Peter had to do is be cultivating, had to be doing, was to cultivate the presence of God in his life every single day so when that moment came, he was ready. Because here's the thing. I never know when the moment's going to come and I walk into my house and my kids need it to be one day. My kids need the power of God that's inside of me. I don't get a warning. I don't get alert on my phone that says, man, your son is going to really need you in five days. You better start reading your Bible. You better start praying. You, you, better, you better go to church every single Sunday the next, you know, Four weeks, because in six weeks, there's going to be somebody at your office that's going to have a tragedy in their family, and they know you're the Christian in the office, and so they're going to come talk to you. So, man, in six weeks, you, you be ready for that day. Man, it's, 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 I'll give you a year, but in one year, your spouse is really going to need you to be strong for them. You know, if that would happen, then we would know. But here's the thing. We never know when one day is going to happen. And that's why every day is so important. Because if it's not in us, we can't give it. We can't give what we don't have. And so we've got to walk around full of it. Every single day, full of the presence of God in our life. Full of the strength of God in our life. Because if we don't have it, we can't give it. But here's the third side of that. We talked about God can use you, even if you don't think you have what it takes. We talk about we can only give what we have. But I know this. And this is where probably this verse convicts me the most. Whatever it is I do have, that's what I give. What did Peter say? I don't have what you're looking for, but what I have, I give to you. When you're in need of one day, this is your, I have a chance to make this your one day. What you've been praying for, what you've been needing, but what I have, I give to you. Now that's great when what I have is peace. And somebody needs it, and I give them peace. And that's great when what I have is strength and joy, and then I come across a need, and what comes out of me? What I have, I give to you, strength and joy. Can I tell you where I found myself too much? I find a need, and what I have is maybe anger. What I have is fear. What I have is maybe there's some sin in my life. And this is the moment they need in me because, you know, what I have, I give to you. And sometimes that's good news, but I'm going to tell you, sometimes that's bad news. And that's why it is so important that I'm checking my heart every single day. I didn't give them this scripture either, but I just, I just thought of it. In Proverbs, I think it's chapter 4, verse 23. If not, go look it up and find it. Ask Pastor Mike. He'll know. <laughs> Proverbs 4, 23. It says, above all else. Did I get that reference right? Go look at it. I'm giving you homework tonight, all right? Your kids got homework. You got homework. We're not putting it on the screen. You go look it up. Proverbs 4.23. Solomon, the wisest man in the history of the world, said, above all else. Now, how many know when the wisest man in the history of the world writes a book about wisdom, and then in that book says, and this is the most important thing in the book, that's a verse to pay attention to. He says, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Now, what he's saying, our heart is a well. And all day long, we're dipping a bucket down into that well, and we're pouring it on people that are around us. We're pouring it on situations that are important to us. So when I dip that bucket down into my well, if I've not been guarding my heart, and my heart is full of fear, my heart is cynical, my heart's full of negativity, maybe my heart's full of anger, my heart's full of disobedience. Let me tell you something, that bucket goes down there automatically. You can't stop the bucket 
all you can do is protect the well. That bucket goes down when I'm home and I'm with my kids, when I'm at work and I'm around people, when I'm in the community and I'm talking to people, whatever's in my heart, that bucket is dipping down and it's pouring down on people's lives. When I'm facing a situation in my life that I don't have the answer to, that bucket's dipping down and it's pouring that. And, and hopefully it's not pouring fear. Hopefully there's peace in my heart. Hopefully there's joy in my heart. Hopefully there's faith in my heart. And that's why Solomon says the most important thing above all else, guard your heart for it's the wellspring of life. But it's so much more important when we come across someone that's lame on the side of the road and they're looking to us for the answer. That if we can say, I don't have what you think you need, but what I have, I give to you. And what I've got right now is faith. What I've got right now is compassion. What I've got right now is patience. What I've got right now is the love of Jesus. And I'm gonna dip that bucket down and I'm gonna pour it all into your life. In fact, let me skip ahead. Look at verse seven. I had this with another point, but we're gonna do two points out of verse seven. Is that okay? And I won't charge anything extra. Because he says, what I have, I give to you. And here's what I love about this miracle. And I remember this, because then look in verse seven. It says, taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. Why did Peter have to do that? Like, if you got enough faith, like that took faith. Like, I've done hospital visits. I'll be honest, I've never in a hospital visit said, Rise up and walk, all right? I don't, you know. And so Peter, man, full of faith. That man, so you, got, you got some money? I ain't got no money. But what I have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus. And everybody's listening to him. Rise up and walk. And if you got enough faith to do that, can't you expect him to just get on up? I mean, if God's going to heal him, can't God get him up? But Peter didn't do that. Peter said, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And I think because he was just adrenaline, so excited. He just reached down and grabbed that man and jer it jerked him up. And so here's what I think is interesting. I think it's the partnership of God's power and Peter's hand. God didn't need Peter, but that's always the way he chooses to work. There's something about when we can say, man, God's going to change your life, and I'm going to reach down and help pick you up myself. There's something about that. God doesn't need me, but he chooses to use me. God doesn't need you, but he will choose to use you. And there's this combination of saying, man, I don't have the answer. Silver and gold have I none. What you're looking for, I ain't got none of it. But God does, and God can change your life. And I'm going to grab you right by the right hand until that happens. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to stand with you. I love the way Peter, and that's why it's so important that we're full of God's love. So here's the real reason I was going to read verse 7, all right? So he says, taking him by the right hand, he helped him up. And instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong, and he jumped to his feet and began to walk. So I'm going to take some liberties because here's something I thought about because I don't know if any of you, like, like I can be cynical and kind of think of the negative side. Anybody do that? Like you just kind of see, or is anybody here like, and, and I'm, I guess I'm both, because there's some people that make fun of me this, that there's some people, the big idea people, and there's some people that thought, well, you don't have to deal with insurance. That's why you can have those ideas. You know what I'm talking about? Have you thought about liability? You know, all this kind of stuff. And so there's both, I'm, I guess I'm on both sides. Because here's what I thought. So this man, is he's, he's lame, and I just wonder if he's like lame by the side of the road. And so, you know, he's laying here, and then Peter says, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk, and takes him by the hand, and he's so excited. And then the guy next to him says, man, this is awesome. You don't have to beg anymore. You can get a job. And the guy's like, hold on. I hadn't thought through that. I mean, I don't know if you've ever thought about it. All these people in the Bible get healed. The Bible just keeps moving, and we don't know what their life is like. And so now he's got to get a job. Now he's got to find new friends because he's been hanging out with these people by Gate Beautiful all his life. And now, I mean, it'd be weird just kind of hanging out with them, and, you know, he's got to, his whole life has changed. And so this is, when you talk about one day, I think remember this. Standing brings struggle. Standing brings struggle. Still the best day in his life. All right? But every dream brings its own difficulty. 
So whatever my one day is, Lord, one day, I can't wait till this. God's going to give me my one day, and it's going to turn into my next prayer request. Isn't that, I mean, I think kids are one of the greatest examples of that. Lord, one day, man, life will be awesome when I just have kids. And then you have kids, and then you begin to pray, Lord, don't let me kill these kids. Our miracle really just becomes our next prayer request. And in fact, I was thinking about this because I'm susceptible to this. If we're not careful, God's blessing in our life can only become the next thing that we complain about. Does that make sense? Man, you pray one day, I'm going to be the boss. And we complain about the boss. And then God makes us the boss. And we complain about all of our employees. One day, I mean, I was looking at my house, man, I, I love my house, and I was like, man, one day we'll have this house and have all this stuff, and then I'll walk around and look at all the stuff I got to fix on my house. All of a sudden, my utility bill is bigger than it used to be, and I used to pray for a house, now I'm praying for God to provide for the utility bill. Does that make sense? Man, here's the thing, that process never stops, and it's okay, that doesn't mean that we don't pray to be healed, we don't pray for that one day, but we just got to know on the front end that when God allows us to stand, that's still going to come with its own struggle. We, we, you know, we still, and, and, and here's what I love about him, man. His life was changed, his friends, his responsibility. Some, that's why some people get healed, and then they lay right back down. All of a sudden, they get what they prayed for, but they didn't realize the responsibility that it came with. And they go right back to where, now this man didn't do this, and we'll, we'll see this later on. But our one day creates the need for another. I've got to understand, there, it's not going to be an absence of struggle in my life. When I get what I always prayed for, God's just taken me to another level. And it's still going to come with a struggle. Let's look at the next verse. They said, then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. Here's the next part of one day. We need to run to God's house. I love where he went. Run to God's house. I wrote this statement down for myself. Where do I run when God gives me my one day. Because here's what I've done in the past, and here's what I've seen people do in the past. When I'm on the side of the road, waiting for God, man, I am seeking him like crazy. When my one day hasn't got here, man, I'm at every single make room night, I'm in morning prayer, I'm reading my Bible, I'm listening to worship on the way to, you know, in in my vehicle, Man, I am seeking God with everything that I have. And then someone walks by and says, in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk and picks me up. See you, God. Got what I needed. I run to my house. I run to my friend. I I run wherever. I Because really, all I wanted to do was just run over here. I didn't want God. I wanted God's power to free me to do whatever I wanted to do. This man didn't do that. He ran to God's house. And I think when God gives us our one day, one of two things happen. We got what we wanted, and we're gone. We just go in our own direction. And that's what most people do. That's, let's be honest, that's what all of us have done at one time or another. Or the other thing happens. God does a miracle in our life, and we're like, man, God's power is awesome. If he can do that, if he can do that when I was lame, what can he do with me when, I, when I'm whole? What can he do with me when I can walk? I want to be just as desperate for God when I'm healthy, whatever you want to call that, as I am when I'm sick. I want to have that desperation. For, and one of the things I love, man, he jumped up and he, he ran, he jumped, but he went with Peter and John to God's house. And man, it would be so sad if my lack of my one day, my lack of my dream, created a desperation for God in me that kept me close to him. But then when I finally got what I thought I always wanted, it became the worst thing for me. Because the truth is, I'd rather be sitting on the side of the road with the presence of God in my life than in some palace without God's presence. And I don't know what your dream is. I don't know what your one day is. I don't know what you're expecting from God. 
But I think we ought to already be praying, Lord, I wanna be desperate for you every single day of my life. Not just when I can't pay the bills, I wanna be desperate when I've got surplus. I, I, I wanna love you when I've got it all because I, I wanna run to God's house. And the last thing is this, talking about our one day. It says, when all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what, God, at what had happened to him. Here's the last thing for one day. Someone's waiting on your story. Someone is waiting on your story. Here's what I think is so interesting about this last verse. Peter may have been the best preacher in the history of the world. I mean, we don't have a lot of, we got sermons written. None of us, obviously, nobody's alive has ever heard Peter preach. But his first sermon, 3,000 people got saved. He was with Jesus. Peter was a great preacher. John's writings are some of the most beautiful in the world, but even in the Bible. You have two of the best preachers, theologians, been with Jesus. Why wouldn't anyone want to hear Peter and John but if you look in verse 10, when the crowd gathered, they don't say a word about Peter and John. Who do they talk about? They talk about the man that they saw that was lame on the side of the road. And now he is walking and jumping and running and praising God. And I want you to know this, and I want to talk specifically to, to whoever this gets on your heart. You've got a one day in your heart. It's not for you, it's for someone else. And they are waiting on your story. They're waiting to hear about how you were laying on the side of the road in whatever way that you are. And one day God came in and healed you. And you are gonna be able to share God's love and God's power and God's patience and God's forgiveness and His mercy and His wisdom in a way that I never can. And you may be sitting here tonight and you don't have one scripture memorized and you would pass out if we put you on this stage. You don't wanna to speak to nobody. You don't feel like you know anything about the Bible. You're kind of like the silver man. I, I got none of that. But if you've got a miracle in your life, if God has delivered you from something, if you used to be lame by the side of the road in whichever way you were lame, but you rose up and walked and now you're jumping and running and praising God, God is gonna use that to reach people that I could never reach, that Pastor Mike could never reach, that Joel Osteen could never reach. And that's why it's so important that we tap into the power of God when it's available to us because it's not about us. And look, you know, we, we said before, God's plan for our life, it's gonna be greater than we could have ever imagined, but it's gonna be more difficult than we could have ever imagined. In fact, I, I think this, it's gonna be more painful than we could have ever imagined. I think God's will in my life, I'm gonna shed more tears than I could have ever imagined. I'm gonna need more strength than I could have ever imagined. But when I'm going through those moments, where it's way harder than I thought it would be, it hurts more than I thought it did, it takes more than I thought it would, I remind myself I'm not just doing it for me. Because if I were doing it for me, I'd lay right back down. But there is somebody, and I want you to know this, there is somebody that's relying on you to stand up. They're relying on you no matter how hard it is, no matter how many tears it takes, no matter how, how much the pain is, they're relying on you to rise up and walk because they're laying on the side of the road with the same issue that you have and they need to see that God can do that. And it doesn't take me or Pastor Mike preaching them a sermon. They need to see someone that was in the same position that they were in and God changed their life. And they're waiting on you. What God is doing in your life is so important. There are th thousands of people that are represented that need you to be everything that God has called you to be and to walk in everything that God has called you to walk in because someone is waiting on your story.